I'm on. Can you hear me? Do you have any muted back there? Can you all hear me okay? Turn it up some. They can't hear me. Number one. Hello. There we go. Greetings, friends. Well, how about this angelic voice that Freddie sent instead? This is Sophie. This is Sophie. And uh, when Freddie said he couldn't be here and he'd have somebody feeling he didn't say he was sending an angel. That's a little too hot. That's a little too hot. But we're happy to have you. And Lewis and Alan, thank you very much. Um, just a few announcements tonight. A reminder that the list for the food for the Thanksgiving food drive, uh, they're on each table as you come and go. Make sure you take one of these with you because if you have one, then when you go to the store, it's more likely you'll pick up an item or two. So make sure you take one of these uh, when you leave tonight if you don't already have one. Um, you might notice here in the room, there's it looks a little different than usual. You know, instead of just the regular chairs that you're used to seeing, there's tables with fancy tablecloths and all these decorations. The ladies had a retreat in here today, and they had 50-some ladies, and they represented six different local churches were here. And this is just an amazing thing because when churches have uh, uh, things like that, they don't get six churches from the community coming to one place. Uh, we have rep people here from Calvary, from Coral Ridge, from Christ Church, from Davy, from uh, Wesleyan Community, Coastal Community, and of course here. There were ladies from Grace Wesleyan here too. So, uh, but they had a marvelous time and uh, uh, they were glad they came and I'm sure they're gonna go back to the relative churches and talk, uh, uh, talk it up about how good a time they had. And so we're, we left the decorations up so you could see uh, uh, the extent uh, of the, per, the, the preparation and the work that the ladies put in to uh, these retreats that they put on and welcome other ladies too. Uh, so stay tuned for the spring event that they're gonna do in the spring, that's many months away, but uh, just get you, we just want you to have an idea on what it is that they do. Uh, next weekend, we have a ton of stuff going on. Friday night, we have the trunk or treat, and if you haven't signed up for a, a car yet, uh, uh, contact me or, or Mimi uh, about having a trunk outside. Uh, we are still collecting candy, and we need candy uh, uh, to be able to hand out. And just no chocolate. We're asking for anything but chocolate because it's still South Florida, and it's still likely to be warm on Halloween. And then on Saturday morning, we have our men's prayer breakfast. If you have not signed up for that prayer breakfast, please see Patrick here tonight. He's got the sign up. If, if you know somebody that's not here tonight that might be interested or might be coming, let Patrick know about that. He can reach out to them or they can reach out to Patrick. We want to try to get a, a good head count because we're going to have food. And men, uh, we made enough food for the ladies that had a little left over, but men don't do that. Men eat a lot of food and there won't be leftover. So we, yeah, so we need to make sure we have a good head count, right? And so then next Sunday, a week from tomorrow, we have the joint fellowship between us and the Shepherd of the Coast. Joel has prepared sign-ups for the potluck. Uh, they're, they're over here, Joel, the sign-ups, right over this table and then up at the front. Now, this is gonna take place at about noon on Sunday. Our service gets over at 1030. Their service gets over at 11 on the fifth Sunday. And so after our service, we're gonna set the tables up among the chairs and then we'll have our food here. We're hoping some of the people from Saturday night service, that's y'all, will come on Sunday and bring a potluck and come back here by noon on Sunday to have the joint fellowship with us and them. Okay, this is the first time we've done something intentional with our church and their church. And so we would like to have a, a good representation and also have a chance for us to get to meet some of them. And so uh, we're hoping that you can make time on Sunday to come and have lunch with us if you're a Saturday night attender. And our Sunday morning folks will just bring a potluck. And uh, um, bring, so if you have to run back home and get it and bring it back to warm, okay, that's fine. But we'll eat about noon. Isn't that right, Joel? We'll eat about, about noon, okay? And uh, uh, then we have our regular events, Monday night to the ladies and the men's, and Tuesday night to Bible study and the chosen. And um, then this Thursday night, there's nothing. So... That's the events for this week. Bands, it's all yours.
break into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces graces waiting for you dance like the weight has been lifted graces waiting where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there is freedom come out of the dark just as you are into the fullness of his love for the spirit the sound of Jesus name lives made whole hearts awake at the sound of Jesus name chains will fall prison shake at the sound of Jesus name lives made whole hearts awake at the sound of Jesus name For your mercy never fails me In all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head For I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life. 
the good
Pray for our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We just thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you blessed our church today and the ways you care for each of us every day, all day. Lord, we offer back a small part of what you first gave us. We ask that you accept these gifts, Lord. May they be used according to your will and purposes to build your kingdom. Lord, may the meditations of all of our hearts, wherever we are, and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Greetings, church. You know, uh, anybody ever felt like Monday was like this brutally long day of the week? Like, is Monday your longest day? Well, for four weeks now, we've been on Monday with Jesus. That Monday when he came after Palm Sunday, when he came into Jerusalem, you know, the, the day started off with, oh, there's a fig tree, and he goes over to the fig tree, and, and there's no figs. So he cursed it, it dies. He goes to the temple, and he, uh, he con he's confronted right away by what he, because of what he did the day before, which is overturned all the tables, the money changers. So right off, the chief priest and the elders jammed him up. And then he has all these confrontations with them. Remember the three parables about, uh, uh, and let's make sure we understand that what those parables were about. The parables were about God having expectations of what the nation of Israel was going to do in terms of bearing fruit for God's kingdom. And they didn't. And so God turned the vineyard over to other tenants right? And he invited other people to the banquet, the good and the bad, to the wedding banquet. And let's not forget the, the, the two sons, the one who said he would go in the field and didn't, that was Israel, and the one who said, I'm not following God's law, but then ended up doing it. Okay? Well, after all of that, Jesus is going to be confronted yet again. But to understand the, the true gravity of the confrontation for tonight, you got to get a little history lesson. And I know history's left for nerds like me, but because I'm a nerd about it, I get to come share it with you, okay? Tonight we're going to have a couple characters uh, uh, that we read about in Matthew, uh, but we don't really pay that much attention to it. And that is we have the Pharisees and the Herodians coming together, okay? Now, those two coming together is like, Florida State and Florida fans coming together. It's not happening. In the normal, in a normal set of circumstances, that's not happening, right? Just not happening. Unless they're going to antagonize each other, but they're not going to go together to do something unless it's to beat up on Miami. But anyway, the truth of the matter is you need to understand the Herodians are only mentioned in Matthew. The Herodians. And yes, it's connected with King Herod. See, the, when the Romans conquered Judea in 60 B.C., they defeated this dynasty called 
the Hasmonean dynasty. It had been ruling the Air Judea for some generations here. And Herod the Great, the fellow we know as Herod the Great, had been one of their little governors, like a, a, a mayor sort of a county of a little district. And when Rome defeated the Hasmoneans, Herod jumped up and goes, me, 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 let me be, let me be Rome's representative in this area. Let me run this for you. I'm a Jew. I know how these people think and operate. Well, now, Herod was a Jew in the sense that his mother was Jewish, but his father wasn't. And it's doubtful that Herod the Great, who became King Herod, was really a truly practicing Jew. He just was kind of a Jew for the sake of Rome, thinking he was a Jew for managing the people. Okay? So he was like a cultural Jew, let's say. Okay, because everything King Herod did was about himself, right? I mean, he built the temple grand and all that, but most of the big things he built were to edify himself. I mean, he was known as Herod the Great Builder. That's where Herod the Great comes from. The, the builder was on the end of it. Herod the Great Builder, he built a lot of really big stuff uh, during his reign. Well, then when he died, he left his son, three sons, actually. They were tetrarchs over areas in Herod Antipas, you remember that name? We've talked about that a few times. He was the Herod that actually sat in on Jesus' Jesus's trial. That was the King Herod, Herod the Great's son. And the people that supported Herod Antipas were Herodians. Those were the Herodians. They were people that were nominally Jewish. They, they supported Herod Antipas and the Roman connection because Look, if you didn't have a connection with Rome, you weren't really in power in, in any way, shape, or form, really, right? I mean, Rome had the soldiers. They had the, 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 the clout. And so the Herodians were people that supported Herod Antipas. Okay? So, you know, we know the elders were the Jewish people that were like the elites that supported the temple and stuff. And so they were, they were tight with the chief priests, right? And then you had the Pharisees, who were different from the chief priests, but they had a very strict adherence to the laws of the Old Testament, all 613 of them. And then you had these Herodians. That they're only mentioned in Matthew. They're kind of an obscure group in history. We just sort of know who they are based on some of the historians, Josephus, and some of the other people that wrote about them. But the Herodians, because they supported Herod Antipas, they were more aligned with Roman dictates and the Roman predilections in the area. Whereas the Pharisees, the Pharisees were against everything about Rome. The Pharisees, Rome was the oppressor. They taxed the people heavily. Oh, let's speak about the taxes for a second. Roman Judea, people were taxed at about 49%. 49%. Here's the breakdown. 32% went to Rome. 19% was just on your crops. 19% was the value of your produce. And 13% was a, a sales tax, poll tax, a, a little this odd and sundry taxes. So the total of 32% went to Rome. But there was 49%. Because the temple, the temple got another 12. The temple got 12%. 8% was on your crops. So Rome's getting 19% of your crops. The temple's getting 8%. So your crops are getting taxed 27% right off the top. And then the temple got another 4% for the temple tax and the, you know, the annual headcount tax and all the kind of stuff that the temple got. So the temple got 12% altogether. Then there was a little 5%. Check this out. There was 5% that went to the corrupt administrators. You know, like the tax collectors, people like that. They added 5% on the taxes they collected for Rome. That's how you get to the 49%. So half of everything that the, the Jews, the people in Judea produced in a year, half of it went to taxes. So the Pharisees were against all this taxation and the oppression of the people. Okay, so you have the Pharisees who are against everything Roman and strict adherence to the laws of the Jewish laws. And you have the Herodians 
who are about everything Rome and Roman, okay, and they're nominal Jews. They don't ascribe to the 613 laws. They don't believe in strict adherence and all that. You have Florida State and Florida. They are completely different politically, uh, uh, theologically. Uh, uh, one's very invested, one's barely. Okay? So these are the two people that are going to come together and challenge Jesus at this point. Okay? So let's pick up in... Now, this, this is happening immediately after the banquet story that we read last week. It goes straight from the banquet story into this. So we're going to be in chapter 22, and we're going to pick up in verse 15. Here's the reading. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to, to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose, and, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The gospel message for God's people. Thanks be to God. Okay. So you have Florida State and Florida going to come together to trick Jesus. The fact that they came together, the fact that they came together, everybody who read Matthew's account or heard Matthew's account in the Apostles' Teaching program of the day knew right off the bat those two people didn't come together on the same side for anything. So it had to be a trick. It had to be a trap. So they're, they're going to, and they, they start off by flattering Jesus. We know you're a man of integrity. You only teach the truth, God's truth. And, and you don't care who people are, what their station in life is. You treat everybody fairly. But tell us your opinion. And the, Jesus knew right off what they were up to, right? So he says, Give me one of the coins. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't tell us who gave him the coin. Was it a Pharisee? Or was it Herodian? Because, see, who gave him the coin speaks to who has money from the realm. The Roman coin. That's a Roman coin. Now, normally, the Pharisees, being who they were, man, they didn't want to be caught anywhere near a Roman coin. And here's why. The coin itself was blasphemy because what the coin said, it had a picture of Tiberius who was the, the emperor at the time. And below his name, it said he was divine. That's blasphemy to a monotheistic practicing Jewish person. That coin was blasphemy because it had a picture of a human being that said he was God, the emperor. So maybe it was a Herodian that gave him the coin, but they gave him the coin. And he said, whose picture's on it? Oh, it's Caesar's. And he remembered, he said, whose inscription? And they didn't say that part, did they? They just said whose picture it was. Because the inscription said, the divine one. And so... Then he says, okay, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Because the Jews had their own coinage. Did y'all know that? The Jews had their own coin, separate coins. The temple had separate coins made. And those coins didn't have anything referencing God on them. They had like wheat, a picture of wheat for good you know, production and stuff like that, uh, natural things, because they didn't want to be sacrilegious about anything. It was, it was to pay the temple tax with. In fact, if, if you traveled from somewhere to on pilgrimage and you came to Jerusalem and you wanted to pay your temple tax while you were there, your head tax to the temple, that's what the money changers were for in the temple. You would take your Roman money or your Greek money or wherever you came from and you would change it for 
a temple coin. And then that temple coin you would go pay. Now, if you've ever gone and exchanged American money for foreign currency before you traveled here or over there or whatever, you know there's a, a fee, right? Usually a percentage of the money that you have to pay. And that's what Jesus was talking about. The money changers taking advantage of people. That probably falls in that 5% we were talking about at the beginning. So Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. So, okay, so the coin is Caesar. So give Caesar his coins. Give to him. If he's taxing you, pay your taxes to Caesar. Because who ultimately allows Caesar to be on his throne? God, right? I mean, God let Cyrus come in and kick out the Babylonians and then run the Jews, uh, Judea for a little while. Then the Romans came in. and So God allowed all these things to happen. So ultimately, we believe that even our government today, somehow God allows it. God's not putting people there, but He does allow certain things. You know, and maybe what's happening to us now is a more a function of the misbehavior of the nation, maybe. You know, the, the dysfunction that's leading our government right now. I'd say that's just as much a consequence of the general people's failure to be obedient, follow God. I mean, Fred shared some figures with us last year about the percentage of people in America that claim to be Christian. For many of us, most of our lifetime, it's been high, like 80 or 85 or 90 percent of people claim to be Christian, even though probably 80 percent of those people never really went to church much. Maybe once a year, Christmas and Easter, priesters. Okay, so we've got these people that are looking at the leadership of, of the nation here and the Herodians and the Pharisees are challenging Jesus and he's saying give to Caesar his coins and give to God's what's God's. So what is God's? Have you thought about what's God's in this? I mean, we know give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God's God's, but we do, do we really understand what is God's? If God allows Caesar to be on the throne and you give to Caesar what is Caesar's, what is God's? Like everything? Everything? If everything's God's, including us, Caesar, everything we see, everything we touch, Everything we are, it all belongs to God, right? Doesn't it? So when Jesus answered the question, because they tried to trick him, because you do understand if he says, no, you don't pay to Caesar, you don't have to pay taxes to Caesar, and so take the Pharisees' line of thinking, then the Herodians are going to run back and tell Antipas, this guy's being seditious. He's trying to overthrow Rome. He's saying don't pay taxes. So he didn't say that. And... If he says to pay taxes, then he's going against what the Pharisees are saying. And, and the Pharisees generally enjoy good rapport with the people. I mean, the people understand the Pharisees are about doing God's work, whether they feel oppressed by the, the laws or not. The truth of the matter is, generally speaking, the Pharisees were held in high regard by the people. So either Jesus takes the Pharisees' line or the Herodians' line, and he chose neither. Give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. And so neither one of them was happy. They just says they went away. Says they were amazed. How did he slip out of this trick too? We thought we had a surefire trap for him. And he slipped out again. It's like, like a Nazareth when they were going to throw him off the cliff and he walked back in between them, right? And got away. So let's talk for a minute. What is this is God's thing? Do we, really, do we really understand or act like or believe that everything is God's? I mean, sometimes we think, you know, I, I worked hard for what I have. I worked really hard. Worked a long time and hard. for what, And I worked smart, too, for what I have. I earned it. It's mine. I did this. Did you? You did it all on your own. God didn't give you any special gifts. 
He didn't give you any special abilities. He didn't create opportunities. There was never any providential happening to open doors for you. Right? Did it all on your own. Completely on your own. Do you believe that? I don't. What I believe is I needed mercy so that I didn't get the consequences I deserved, even though there were times when I did have to face up to consequences, just like most all of you have probably. You make some bad decisions and boom, you have to pay a price for that one way or another. You make good decisions, you get a reward, right? We understand mercy is not getting what we deserve and we understand grace is getting blessings that we didn't earn. So how much of the blessings that we have, the good fortune, the good job, the nice house, the good stock portfolio, or whatever it happens to be, do we consider a great blessing? Do we understand that that's a function of grace? Grace. Have we received a blessing that we really didn't deserve? Because let's be honest. Every good and wonderful thing we have came from God. That's what we say when we pray for our offering. Lord, we know it came from you. And so Jesus says, give to God what is God's. You think God needs our money? You think God needs our money? No. What do you think God needs? All of us. All of us. He starts with our heart, but He wants all of us. He wants our hands, our feet, our hearts, our tongues. He wants our willingness. He wants our perseverance. He wants us to run the race He puts before us. These three parables that preceded today's query from the Pharisees and the Herodians was all about people not doing what God had expected of them. And they knew full well. Hear this, church. God had been telling the nation of Israel, His covenantal people, what He expected of them. To go share God with the world. To create people to come in. Because He promised Abraham that His descendants would populate the whole world, right? But yet Israel held on to their God as their God and nobody else's God. Except for occasionally they would go worship Baal or some other God occasionally. Set up a little altar and stuff. Not in the temple usually, but somewhere else. But they would go intermarry and worship others. But they wouldn't allow other people to worship Yahweh. No way are you going to worship Yahweh. He's our God. And so God set aside the nation of Israel for a time. And we're in that time. Some Jews did hear the message of Jesus. And we know those as Messianic Jews, right? Completed Jews, however you want to look at it. But we're in that little time right now where mostly the Jewish people that don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, their hearts have been darkened. They've been darkened for a time. But make no mistake, when Jesus comes back, their eyes are going to be open because every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. And that includes the Jews with the darkened hearts. It includes us when Jesus comes back. Are we bearing fruit, church? Remember, right now, as Gentiles, we've been invited into the vineyard. We, we are the new tenants of the vineyard. We are the good and the bad that were invited to the banquet. We're the ones that we depend on Jesus imputing His righteousness onto us so that we have the proper garments on when the banquet is held. Are we being faithful to God? Are we doing God's work? as individuals and as a church, and more broadly than that, how are we as Christians in this day and age, in this place called North America, how are we doing? How are we doing in tending to God's vineyard? Are we doing good? Are we doing okay? Are we doing poorly? How are we doing? See, that's something we need to ask ourselves, each of us individually. Because if we're going to give to God what is God's, and we kind of broadly understand that it's all God's, 
and we're supposed to give to God what's God's. What is, what is God's in our individual context? What's God in your context? What is God asking for you? Is He wanting you to surrender something that you keep hanging on to? Most of us fall in that category. We're hanging on to something because either we like it or it's a long-time habit or it's something we just don't know how to give up. Maybe we're afraid if we give that up, there'll be nothing. I, had a, I have a daughter that for a while, she kept hanging on to Mr. Wrong. Y'all ever known somebody, that, a girl or a guy, that's hanging on to a part of that you know is not good for them? They fight all the time. They're always in and out, in and out, in and out with each other. But for 12 years, they stay together. Y'all know, know people like that? Or have you known people like that? And our daughter says, I don't know why I can't meet just a good guy. And Annette says, you got your hand clenched on Mr. Wrong. God can't put something in your hand when you've got it closed on something else. So what is God asking you to surrender? That's given to God too. What is God surrendering? See, it's hard to be obedient when we won't let go of stuff. And I admit that's a challenge. All of us have gone through it to degrees, right? But we never get to stop, friend. We never get to stop. Do you understand that? When you think you've arrived, what you really are, are y'all hear this? When you, when you think you've arrived, what you arrived at is the next step. Okay? When you've arrived, you've just arrived at the next step. You've got another step to go. Always another step. You never get done. Just saying. As long as you're a child of God, a disciple of Christ, and a sinner, which those are our identities, as long as you're one of those three, you're never done. Because God's working on you. So friends, when we have nice events like the ladies had here, and we get to celebrate that, that we had six different churches represented here, and, and that means that it's Grace Wesleyan. Friends, we're in a, a church less than three years old, and we're accepted by the church community around us. That's something to celebrate. But it should also be a reminder that we just arrived at the next step. So have you arrived? And what's your next step? So for this week, ponder for you. What is it that you have to give to God that already belongs to God? He's waiting for you to surrender to Him. Give to God what is God's. For each of us, that means something. And as a church... It means a collective of things. Jesus just told, if you don't do, it's okay. God's just going to go find somebody else. And we're receiving blessing here as our church. Today's event was proof that God is blessing our efforts. I want you all to see that and understand that. God is blessing what we're doing. That means we've arrived at the next step. So may we do our best to discern what that is for us so we can continue as a church and as individuals to give to God what is God's. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that, give me a second. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, that week in Jerusalem, we're on Monday, but just a couple nights from now, he's going to have a meal to celebrate the Passover meal with his disciples in that place we know as the upper room. And at that meal, Jesus took the bread. He raised it to heaven and thanked God for it. Then he blessed it and he broke it. And he told his disciples, this bread is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins each time you eat of it do this in remembrance of the things I've done for you 
At the end of the meal, he took the cup of wine. He raised it to heaven and thanked God for it. Then he blessed it. And he passed it to his disciples and he said, This wine is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of the things I've done for you. And so, Lord, we ask that through your Holy Spirit, you make for us this bread and juice, the body and blood of Christ, so as we partake of it, we might be the body and blood of Christ to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, as Wesleyans, we serve an open table, and what that means is it doesn't matter where you come from and what your background is. Jesus came for everybody. He died for all, and he instituted the sacraments for all. So we serve communion two ways here. We do it by intention here. We line up and we serve it here. If you prefer, you can take it in your seat. Annette will bring around a tray with the little cups with the wafers, and she has some gluten-free uh, wafers if you need those. Friends, the table is open, won't you? Good afternoon, church. Again, it's my pleasure to be back with you this weekend. Unfortunately, I'll be gone next weekend. I'll be traveling to uh, South Carolina. My twin nephews are going to be graduating from the uh, Marine boot camp, you know, uh, this weekend. You know, I want to personally th thank all of you for your thoughts and your prayers for my family and I as we had traveled to Arizona last weekend to attend the celebration of life for my nephew Tim Jr. Uh, Tim died of something called diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, Tim was 34 years old and so the celebration of life was what it should be. All family members who attended arrive home safely. We thank God for that. I got a report from Art Applegate, who reports the passing of his brother on Wednesday evening in Minnesota. Uh, his brother is survived by his wife, Claudia, and two children. We also learned today that our sister, uh, Carol Hane, passed away this morning. Now, arrangements are forthcoming, and we'll soon let you know when we, we have word of any uh, arrangements made for her. Lori Stapleton had knee surgery, and she's at home, and so we just need to pray for her speedy recovery for her. You know, we got to give thanks to God for what he's doing in the church. And we need to just look at these ladies and give them a word of thanks and appreciation. So I'd like to go ahead and thank the women for their wonderful, for their wonderful service. As you can see, you know, with Myron mentioned that there were at least five different churches represented. There were people from, you know, these different churches, and they all fellowship well together, I presume. You know, and so we just thank God for his mercies and his blessings. You know, we have to put on our prayer list and continue to keep on our prayer list the conflict that's going on in the Middle East. We know thousands of people have been killed on both sides. We also know that there are thousands of people who are injured. But also, most importantly, there are individuals who have been captured and is, whole, is being held uh, prisoners. We are fortunate that we had two Americans to return, you know, this week, and we want to thank God for that. So keep this conflict in your in your prayers and pray that there is a ceasefire soon and that the uh, prisoners and the citizens are released and that humanitarian aid comes into that uh, 
into that city. And there begins the possibility of peace. So just keep that in your prayers. So let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving. A praise and thanksgiving, Lord, is for the fact that you have blessed us and you continue to bless us. You blessed us with a wonderful and successful women's retreat that was held early today. We hope that all the women who attended were blessed. And Father, we ask that you continue to bless the women of this church, that they will continue to do your will as they reach out and invite all women to come and participate in fellowship and love. Father, we pray for all those who have lost their loved ones, the Hannay family, the Applegate family, we pray for comfort and peace. You know, it's so difficult, Lord, to lose a loved one. I certainly know about that. But what keeps me and others going who have gone through this is the fact that knowing that you are in control, that all you do is good, but one day we too will be absent from the body and present with you. And we look forward to that day when it occurs. Father, we ask your blessing on those who are suffering and, and needs healing from surgery, needs healing from cancer and other disease and ailments. They continue to need your love your mercy, and your grace. So, Father, we lift these prayers to you when we ask that you hear them and answer them the only way you know how. And so, Father, we lift up the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near. I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. I surrender. to me now. 
Thank y'all for tonight. Sophie, you can come back anytime and sing with us. Anytime. Thank you for coming. Friends, if you haven't picked up your shoe box yet, Sue will meet you out in the narthex when you leave to equip you with a box and a list of the things that you can put in it for uh, helping kids overseas this Christmas. But this week, friends, think about what it is that you can give to God that's God's. And you might start with praise, honor, and glory because for God's holy. He's holy. And we should praise and honor and give glory to Him for everything we have. And see if you can figure out what that thing is that you need to surrender for Him, that He's waiting for you to surrender Him because He wants that too. And friends, as fearful as it might be to get rid of that one thing, remember, Emmanuel, God is always with us, so he knows what it is. He's just waiting for you to acknowledge it. So maybe you can do that this week. Friends, go in peace. Amen.